I used to think my apartment was the one place I was truly safe. Cozy, predictable. All my favorite things in the exact spot I left them. My worn out couch that knew the perfect curve of my spine. The stack of old sci-fi novels on the coffee table. The chipped mug with the slightly cheesy best dog mom ever inscription. But lately, something's felt off. It started with the little things. A hairbrush out of place, which is weird because I live alone. A drawer left slightly open when I swore I'd shut it tight. I figured I was just overworked, scatterbrained from the long hours at the clinic. Even the best vet techs need a good night's sleep, right? But then things got stranger. The framed photo of my parents on vacation, the one by the TV, was turned slightly to the left. Now, I know for a fact, I lined it up perfectly. That picture's been in the same spot for years, and I'm one of those slightly awk types about stuff being just so. It was unnerving, but still, maybe I bumped it without noticing. What I couldn't brush off was the voicemail. One afternoon, I was catching up on laundry, tossing darks into the hamper when my phone pinged. A new message. Strange. I didn't recognize the number. The voice on the other end was husky, almost a whisper. I know what you like, Sarah, it said. That shade of lipstick. The way you laugh when those puppies jump on you. You'll look even prettier when. And then it just cut off. Panic shot through me, hot and sudden. Who was this? How did they know about the lipstick? The shade I'd only bought last week. I listened again, straining to hear any background noise, a trace of where the call came from. Nothing. No clues. My hands were trembling as I deleted the message, trying to convince myself it was just a really creepy wrong number. But the unease stuck to me like a burr. I kept catching glimpses of movement out of the corner of my eye, shadows flitting in the hallway just when I turned, and those misplaced objects kept happening. Not just my things anymore, but stuff in the clinic too. A bandage dispenser left open, a jar of treats upended. It felt like I was living inside a slow motion prank, always one step behind the punchline. The worst part was I couldn't tell a soul. My best friend Emily would roll her eyes and tell me to get a grip. The guys at work would think I was just some hysterical girl losing it over a bad date or something. No. This was different. This was someone messing with my head, making sure I knew my private little world wasn't so private anymore. I just needed proof. Then I wouldn't be Crazy Sarah anymore. I'd be Sarah the victim. The next few days were a blur of forced normalcy. At work, I plastered on a smile, pretending to focus on puppy vaccinations and worried cat owners. Inside, I was a mess of frayed nerves, jumping at every creak in the old building, every unknown number flashing across my phone. I'd never been the type to scare easily, but now the world felt like it was lined with tripwires, just waiting for unsuspecting me to set them off. Evenings were worse. The silence of my apartment stretched into an oppressive thing, punctuated by the tick of the clock and the faint hum of the radiator. Before, I relished the quiet, but now it only amplified the sense of being watched. I tried everything, leaving the TV on late into the night, sleeping with every light blazing. Nothing banished the shadows, the feeling of a pair of eyes glued to my back. The worst was the mirror in my bathroom, I started to hate it. Not because of how I looked. A little sleep, deprived, sure, but nothing catastrophic. No, something had shifted about its reflection. It was subtle, barely perceptible, almost as if it wasn't just my image looking back, but someone else faintly layered over it, someone whose smile was just a touch too wide. That's when the dreams began. Not nightmares exactly, just vivid, hyper real. There were snippets from my days at the clinic, patients and coworkers, except something was always slightly off. A dog would have an extra eye. A kind old lady would whisper unsettling threats as I listened to her heartbeat. I'd wake up in a cold sweat, unsure if any of it had actually happened. 
My phone became a lifeline and a tormentor in equal measure. Every blocked number text sent prickles of dread down my spine. Enjoying your new lipstick, Sarah. That red looks so good on you. Or cute pajamas. Shame. No one else sees them. They somehow always knew exactly what I was doing, what I was wearing. I started changing my routines, trying to throw them off, but it was futile. It felt like a sick game. They were mapping my every move, and I was the clueless mouse in a maze. One afternoon, I was doing inventory in the back room of the clinic. There was soothing white noise of Muzak playing softly, and the methodical task of counting bandage boxes usually calmed my nerves. But today, it just amplified the silence. And then I saw it, tucked behind a bottle of flea shampoo, a tiny old-fashioned camera with a single blinking red light. It was hidden perfectly, facing the doorway. Rage surged through me. I'd suspected surveillance, but finding it, it made everything horribly real. I wanted to smash it, to scream into the tiny lens, but a flicker of cold logic remained. This was my proof. Shaking, I wrapped the camera in a tissue and shoved it into my backpack. There was no way I was calling the cops from the clinic. I just had to get out of there, back to my apartment, to the illusion of safety. My apartment suddenly felt like a war zone, not a sanctuary. I checked every corner, every closet, nothing, no sign of forced entry, no other cameras I could find, but the knowledge that someone had been inside, watching me, cratered the illusion of privacy completely. The discovery of the camera changed something in me. The gnawing fear was replaced by a cold, determined anger. I wasn't going to play the victim anymore. They wanted to scare me. Well, two could play at that game. First step, turning the tables. I replaced the real camera with a cheap broken one I found in the junk drawer. Let my stalker think they were still in control. Meanwhile, I got my hands on a real spy grade setup. Motion, activated night vision, the whole nine yards. One corner of my living room became surveillance central but I disguised it carefully, just a harmless clutter of books and pillows. It was risky, I knew. I wasn't some tech genius. If they were smart, and I had a sinking feeling they were, they'd realize it was a trap eventually, but it was a gamble I had to take. The days took on a strange, split track rhythm. On the surface, I was my normal self, efficient at work, a touch more chipper with Emily and the guys. Like I was putting the whole weirdness behind me. Inside, I was a tightly wound coil, waiting. Waiting for any sign from my stalker and waiting for my camera to catch something. Anything I could use. That sense of being watched intensified. The phantom movements in my peripheral vision became bolder, almost taunting. Like they knew about my plan. My dreams if possible, got worse. They weren't just distorted versions of my days anymore. They were starting to bleed into memories. Real memories, but twisted. My childhood dog with razor. Sharp teeth, my parents whispering threats instead of goodnight wishes. I'd wake up gasping, wondering how much was the stalker messing with my head and how much was my own mind turning traitor. One night, after tossing and turning, I gave up and stumbled out for a glass of water. As I passed the bathroom mirror, the warped smile flickered at me. But as I stared, something shifted. The reflected smile. It wasn't quite mine. The eyes were a shade darker, the curve of the lips cruel. For one heart, stopping moment, it was another face entirely. Then it was gone, just my tired, scared reflection staring back. Shaking it off as a trick of the light, I went back to bed and slept. But that image stuck with me, a nagging splinter in my mind. Had my stalker somehow manipulated the reflection, or was I finally cracking under the pressure? That question, the fear that my own mind was the enemy, that was almost worse than having an outside tormentor. Maybe that was their plan all along, to break me down until I didn't know who to trust not even myself. 
The next few days were a blur of nervous energy and forced normalcy. Each morning, I'd carefully check my surveillance setup. Nothing. No footage of my stalker, no clues to their identity. The quiet was worse than finding something. The waiting, a slow kind of torture. But I was determined not to let them see that it was getting to me. Work became my safe haven, or at least the best approximation of one. Focusing on animals, on the tangible problems I could solve, was grounding. Dr. Evans, the senior vet, even noticed my renewed focus. Whatever was bothering you, Sarah, seems like you're getting back on track, he said one afternoon. I forced a smile and some vague agreement, not about to unload the whole twisted mess onto him. Yet, outside the clinic walls, paranoia tightened its grip. The phantom movements I saw weren't just in my apartment anymore. A shadow flickering past a store window, a sudden hush falling over a coffee shop as I entered. It all felt orchestrated, like the world itself was in on the joke. My social life shriveled. Emily's invitations were met with excuses. The guys at the clinic sensed something was off. Their jovial, teasing petering out into awkward silences. I couldn't blame them. One night, Emily texted, not an accusation, just concern. Hey, you okay? Haven't seen much of you lately. I stared at the screen, thumbs hovering over the keyboard. What could I even say? Sorry. Someone I don't know is systematically ruining my life. So I'm a bit of a recluse now. Typing a generic all good, just busy, seemed pathetic. So I just switched off my phone altogether. The isolation was terrible, but somehow less terrifying than trying to explain the unexplainable to people who wouldn't understand. Sleep became the ultimate battleground. I barricaded my bedroom door, shoving a dresser against it for good measure. Exhaustion would eventually win out, but the dreams, if you could call them that, were relentless. They'd morphed into something far darker than twisted memories. There were figures now, lurking in the shadows, sometimes whispering, sometimes just watching, waiting. The worst recurring figure was a girl, no older than 12, with lank dark hair and eyes that bored into me. In the half-light of the dreams, she'd be standing at the foot of my bed or crouched in the corner of the bathroom. Once, I dreamt she was hunched under my kitchen table, scrambling out like a spider when the light flicked on. One morning, I awoke to an empty water glass on my bedside table. I was absolutely certain I hadn't left it there. The incident sent me into a cold spiral of panic. Were they even leaving my apartment at all anymore? How could they be watching me constantly without ever tripping my alarm? Had they made copies of my keys somehow? That's when the sticky notes started appearing. Not dramatic, not threatening. Just there. A note stuck to the fridge, out of milk, in childlike scrawl. Another on the bathroom mirror, change your toothbrush. As if it was a helpful reminder, it was the ultimate intrusion. My own home, my only supposed safe space, felt hostile now. Each little note wasn't just proof that they were watching my every move. It was proof they were comfortable enough to act, to change things. They were getting closer, bolder, and I was still no nearer to catching them. I was unraveling, thread by thread. Each day became a waking nightmare. The dread, a constant hum beneath the thin veneer of normalcy. The sticky notes became more frequent, their tone shifting. Gone were the folk, helpful reminders. Now they held mocking questions. Is that how you smile? Or unsettling observations? You sleep with your mouth open. I tried to find a pattern. Was it timing, location? Maybe they left the notes when I was in the shower, unable to react. I started taking a waterproof notepad with me, documenting every move, convinced that if I analyzed my routine, I'd find the flaw they were exploiting. It was futile, maddening. The worst was the girl. In my dreams, she wasn't in the shadows anymore. She was front and center, whispering accusations I couldn't understand, her face twisting from mournful to menacing with desizing speed. I'd wake up shaking, 
heart pounding, unsure if the lingering sense of her malevolent stare was fading dream or terrifying reality. One afternoon, walking back from the grocery store, I saw her. Not in a dream, but in the grimy window of a closed-down laundromat. Just a flash of dark hair, those two, knowing eyes. For a wild second, I thought about confronting her, demanding an explanation. But as quickly as she'd appeared, she was gone, leaving only a smudge on the glass. Shaken to my core, I dropped my groceries on the sidewalk, the eggs shattering in a bright yolk mess I didn't bother to clean up. This wasn't just some twisted game anymore. This was someone who was out there, someone who knew my face. The terror spurred a desperate burst of action. I changed all my locks, even though I had no evidence they'd been compromised. I updated every online password, meticulously searching for any trace of a security breach. There was nothing. I was locking a door the horse had long since bolted through. My surveillance setup, my one hope, remained depressingly blank. My stalker was a ghost on camera. Their presence felt but unseeable. In a fit of frustrated rage, I tore down the disguise, ripping out wires and shoving the camera into a drawer. If I couldn't catch them, I refused to give them the satisfaction of watching me unravel further. My apartment became a bunker. Windows were curtained, lights blazing at all hours. I ordered delivery food. The interaction with delivery drivers kept to a minimum behind the triple locked door. Work was the only reprieve, and I poured myself into it. The structure and routine, the life preserver I clung to. Then came the text that shattered even that fragile illusion. Sarah, it began. Then, nothing but a photo. It was me, at work that morning, helping a distraught elderly man with his trembling terrier. I was smiling my usual reassuring smile, completely unaware that someone was capturing the moment. But below the photo in bold letters was a caption, looks like someone found a new favorite patient. My blood ran cold. They'd been in the clinic. How? I scanned the waiting room photos on the clinic website. None of the faces looked familiar. Yet, somehow, someone had been standing there with a phone, watching. My place of sanctuary was just another piece of the stalker's twisted game board. It was the final straw. The next day, I called in sick, voice rough with a lie. I knew I couldn't go back. Not now. But where else was there to go? My apartment was a prison. The outside world a minefield. And then I remembered. There was one place, one person, who might offer something resembling escape. My parents' summer cottage. Remote, tucked away in the woods, barely more than a cabin, really. But it had been my childhood haven. I hadn't been there in years. Not since a fight with my mom over something stupid I couldn't even remember now. But pride and fear melted away in the face of my stalker's relentless pursuit. Desperation outweighed any lingering resentment. I texted them a vague message about needing to get away. Clear up my head. To my surprise, they replied immediately, warmth radiating through their words. Of course, sweetie, come anytime, the keys under the planner. It was a reckless plan, driven by instinct more than logic. But as I hastily packed a duffel bag, throwing in clothes, my laptop, and the unsettling collection of stalker souvenirs, the cryptic notes, a screenshot of that damning text, I felt the first flicker of something resembling hope in a long, long time. The drive to the cottage was a blur of nervous energy and frantic hope. Each mile marker felt like a small victory, distance widening between me and the stalker's suffocating grip. My hands clenched the steering wheel so hard my knuckles ached, eyes darting between the road and the rearview mirror, half expecting to see a shadowy figure in relentless pursuit. The cottage was exactly as I remembered it. Rustic, a little rough around the edges, but with a charm my sterile apartment sorely lacked. The air smelled of pine and damp earth, a welcome contrast to the city's perpetual smog. I stumbled inside, 
duffel bag thudding to the floor and just stood there for a moment, breathing. Relief warred with residual panic. Was this just another move in my stalker's twisted game? Had they somehow led me here? But the silence was thick, broken only by the insistent chirping of crickets outside. I meticulously checked each room, the lock on the back door. Nothing seemed disturbed, no sign of intrusion. Exhaustion, emotional and physical, washed over me. I collapsed onto the worn out sofa, the dusty floral pattern itchy against my skin, and promptly fell into a dreamless sleep deeper than I'd had in weeks. The next few days were a tentative relearning of peace. I woke naturally to sunlight dappling through the trees rather than the blaring shriek of my alarm. I made simple meals with ingredients foraged from the well-stocked pantry, venturing into the tiny town nearby only when supplies ran low. Each trip to the grocery store was nerve-wracking, my eyes scanning faces for the girl with haunted eyes or any lurking stranger, but the fear was lessening. My parents called, their concern tempered by my vague explanations of needing space. I felt a pang of guilt at keeping the truth from them, but the thought of dragging them into my nightmare was too much. Routine was my salvation. I went on long hikes through the woods, the exertion a balm to my frayed nerves. Evenings were spent curled up with a tattered mystery novel, my only company, the occasional hoot of an owl. My phone stayed mostly off, a lifeline I was hesitant to use. The notes, the camera footage, the clinic photo, they all receded, replaced by the simple rhythm of chopping firewood and birdsong. One afternoon, deep in the woods on a trail I vaguely remembered from childhood. It happened, a rustle of leaves too sharp to be the wind, a sense of eyes on my back, prickling my skin. I spun around, heart pounding, saw only the dense green tangle of undergrowth. Tannic flared, then fizzled. It could have been a deer, a rabbit, anything. I scolded myself for letting my guard down, for even a moment of respite feeling like a luxury I didn't deserve. Resolutely turning my back on the unsettling spot, I pushed forward, refusing to let paranoia ruin my heart. One sanctuary. Yet, the incident sowed a seed of doubt. I started to catch glimpses of movement out of the corner of my eye, always disappearing when I turned. The comforting silence of the cottage felt heavy, expectant. One night, I swore I heard footsteps on the creaky wooden porch outside my window, but found nothing in the faint moonlight. Was I relapsing? Manifesting the stalker through my own paranoia? Or were they truly here, toying with me, tightening their control even in this remote haven. Sleep became a battleground again. The dreams returned, not just twisted memories, but fragmented visions of the cottage, the surrounding woods. And always, the girl, her face shifting between accusation and a mournful plea, I couldn't decipher. I'd wake gasping for air, convinced the shadowy figure at the foot of my bed was real. I needed proof one way or the other. Setting my jaw, I retrieved the camera from the depths of my bag. There was no point hiding it anymore. If someone was out there, I'd catch them in the act. The footage over the next few days was excruciatingly dull. Me sleeping, me pacing, me staring blankly out the window. Then came the night that changed everything. I jolted awake, not from a nightmare, but from a sound. A creak on the stairs. My heart hammered a terrified tattoo against my ribs. Grabbing a heavy flashlight, my weapon of choice in this isolated place, I crept out of my room. The living room was bathed in cold moonlight. Nothing seemed to miss, but the creak came again. From upstairs, my parents used the loft space for storage. I hadn't even been up there yet. Flashlight beam trembling. I ascended the narrow ladder-like stairs. The loft was a jumble of boxes and dusty furniture shrouded in sheets. As I swept the light around, it landed on a figure huddled in the far shadows. Who's there? My voice was a hoarse whisper, barely more than a breath. The figure uncurled and the blood drained from my face. It was the girl, the girl from my dreams, 
from the reflection in the laundromat window. She couldn't have been more than 12 years old, thin and trembling in an oversized threadbare hoodie. Her eyes, the same eyes that haunted me, were wide with a mixture of fear and defiance. Part of me expected her to fade away, a figment of my tortured psyche, but she remained stubbornly real, tangibly terrified under the harsh beam of my flashlight. Pooh, who are you? I managed to choke out. The girl didn't answer. She just stared, then slowly, deliberately pulled down the hood. And I finally understood. Thanks for listening. If you like the story, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, and I look forward to your comments. See you in the next video.